of, of the plow. Um, and what that does is the problem with that is when roots end up going down into the soil, you want them to go generally as deep as possible, right? Um, but what happens when you have the soil compaction is that the roots kind of hit that compacted layer and instead of being able to push through and access deeper into the soil, they end up kind of just all, you know, hanging out in the top, you know, 10, 12 inches of soil. Well, why is that a problem? Because what, first of all, you're, you're having reduced access to those deeper nutrients, um, but also you're kind of depleting the new, you know, those roots are more dense up there in that top layer and they're depleting the nutrients in that layer and also the water. So uh, in that top layer. So if you happen to be growing in a place that's bone dry in the summer, depleting that top 10 inches of water uh, is problematic, right? Plants all need a lot of water to photosynthesize. Um, so what that ends up coming to resulting in is uh, reduced yield. So actually one of the things Amy said maybe almost a year ago is uh, a lot of folks who are growing in the area that have soil compaction don't really know what the, the high end of their yield could be because, you know, if they've been farming that ground for decades and it's always been compacted, uh, they have been uh, experiencing those, those limitations. Um, and so compaction is typically caused by uh, compressive forces on the soil, right? So that's, you're running tractors and plows, et cetera, for, you know, maybe for decades, you're gonna run in, uh, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna compact that layer, right? And this is particularly bad when the soil is wet, right? So when you're in the spring, you wanna dry the soil out and you, you know, you till or you plow, you're, you know, leading to more compaction. And then the next year, it's, you know, more ponding has happened. So you want to get out there and you want to till to dry it out in the spring. And then that leads to more compaction, right? So it becomes this vicious cycle. Um, so one of the ways that and maybe the most common way that folks have been addressing that issue is by subsoiling deep tillage, right? So you're just taking a big shank that goes deeper than those 12 inches and you're, you know, pulling it across the field and that does break up compaction, right? But what the drawback is, is that one, it's pretty temporary. If you go back to the same practices, you're going to end up with the same result. Um, I think oh, I, Amy and I have talked a lot about this. And one of the things she said is she thinks of it as like a reset button, right? So you, you get to start over, but if you start over the same practices, you end up where you were. So we wanted to kind of come up with another tool for producers to use, right? So, um, Besides this, uh, all of the other benefits, who, who can name a couple of benefits of cover crops? NRCS folks? Green manure, weed suppression. Yeah, legumes in particular, you were mentioning how to increase your fertility. Uh, legumes, you know, um, uh, we're using fava beans here, but there are a bunch of other ones. Doug used, has used vetch an awful lot, so that's one uh, good, uh, good um, example. Anybody else? Yep, carbon sequestration, more organic matter in the soil. Um, one of the other things that I really like about these deep-rooted crops is that they're basically, you know, they're, they're going down two, three, four feet. They're grabbing nutrients that are basically ready to escape uh, into the, you know, into the water or, or down lower to the soil and bringing them up top of the surface uh, in leaves and then dropping it right where they can be used by the cash crop the next year. Um, so... Yeah, so we wanted to provide this some other tool for producers to use. And there are certain cover crops that have this reputation for, for being able to bio-drill into the soil, right? So you can imagine, you know, those stout cover, uh, uh, tap-rooted uh, crops like, uh, like this tillage radish or fava beans we found. Um, and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, are able to kind of reduce that density uh, in the soil, produce, um, you know, they're, it's basically like, you know, again, biodrilling, you're, you've got holes that are being produced, and there's actually images you can go find where they have used imaging, uh, you know, cameras and, and whatnot in the soil, and you can actually see where cover crop roots have gone down, you know, to a couple of feet, have died, and then the next cover, cro or the next crop, you can see the roots going down to the exact same channels. 
uh, you know, it's like it's less resistant, so that's where they're going to go, and they're going to be able to penetrate more deeply. So, so does that make sense? Any questions about how we how we got here? Cool. Okay. So when we were kind of designing the project, we thought, well, uh, you know, there's uh, advantages to all these different cover crops. Um, so we picked, you know, we picked tillage radish to try because obviously it has this reputation uh, for being really effective with its deep tap root at, at this bio drilling. Um, and uh, the drawback though is that, you know, a lot of vegetable farmers are growing tons of brassicas, right? So it's like kale and collards and Brussels sprouts and kohlrabi and cabbage and turnips and radishes and mustard greens, you know, uh, cauliflower and broccoli, all brassicas. And you probably know that that leads to kind of this pest cycle um, where more pests are going to be present um, in the in the uh, in the ground. So, uh, so we didn't want to just do brassica cover crops. We thought, well, let's let's try. You know, legumes are are uh, uh, beneficial in a lot of different ways. So let's try a legume. And um, actually, kind of a side note, one of the ones that I was really excited about that I had been reading about was cow pea. But everybody I talked to, because it's known for its deep taproot, but everybody I talked to in, uh, you know, kind of King County, Pierce County area said, tried it, don't bother, it doesn't grow here. Well, when we were down at, uh, at the field day a few weeks ago, uh, down by Curtis, Chehalis area, uh, they were growing cowpea as a cover crop. And I said, well, how are you doing this? And he said, our microclimate is that much warmer that even, you know, an hour and a half away, we can actually have a lot of success with it. It's warm enough here. So maybe I'm moving to Curtis. I don't know. That sounds pretty good. Um, in any case, so um, so we picked we picked fava bean because cowpea didn't work um, for us. And the third thing, um, Doug really loves Sudan grass. Produces a lot of biomass really quickly. Uh, roots in the you know roots can uh, can get as deep as five feet even though it's not a tap root it's those you know fibrous grass roots that you um that you i'm sure have seen um so yeah so we so we gave that a try and that became our our third cover crop that we picked so it's fava beans this tillage radish we found one called groundhog we said we thought that sounded promising uh and uh and the sudan grass and then the fourth plots you'll see are just a control with nothing planted so we're growing weeds in those um so yeah and then so to that we wanted to add uh, an irrigation treatment so I think it's really easy for folks to kind of say, you know, this isn't a cash crop. I don't want to dump a bunch of resources into my cover crops. So, um, you know, we don't want to take the time and energy to add water. So we thought, well, let's find out. Let's see what happens. What's the difference? You know, if there's a big difference, then, hey, maybe it's useful. Maybe it's beneficial to, uh, to take the time and energy to water. And if we don't find a difference, then that's good to know, too. Um, but we all know that water makes crops grow so um, and then oh and then the third thing we wanted to test is different planting dates because we're doing you know I think people are, are you know maybe generally associate cover crops with kind of a you know fall to winter um, cover crops and but we're doing we're doing summer cover crops we wanted to see how that worked and so um, we did one planting date for early July and a second planting date in early August and you'll see the difference is actually the, the plots like this one that look mowed, I just mowed them. Uh, and so those are the August ones. But what I did do is I left some, some um, a little bit at the ends so you can kind of see what they looked like before we mowed. Yeah. So when you're talking about the two different dates, are you planting one uh, set of seeds at that time and staggering the, the planting? Or are you planting all three at one time and then all three at another time? Mm, okay, so that's a good question just two dates we did half of the plots uh on i think here what did i say july 9th and then the second group of plots we planted all of them on the other half on august 6th okay. yeah so um so you know obviously you'll be able to see a difference and that's important because you know if somebody wants to try to get a crop in early in the season or late in the season 
uh, you know, it, you can kind of, we wanted to be able to look at all these factors and be able to say, hey, you know, this is what we had, had good luck with. This might work for you also. And it also has to do with a little bit of like maintenance. Um, we want to know when it flowers, right? Since we don't want it to go to seed, so we have to kind of be paying attention to, uh, you know, to those different dates to know when to, when to mow them or, or terminate them. Um, okay, any questions on that so far? Am I leaving anything out? Cool. Fertilizer. Fertilizer. Yeah. How did it's I It's not a that? factor, but we... Yeah, but we did. We, uh, we fertilized. We added, I think, uh, the equivalent of 50 pounds of nitrogen in the form of feather meal um, on all of the plots except... We didn't do that to fava bean, right? Because fava bean is going to kind of take care of its own nitrogen. It also means we, we fertilized the, the weed plots, so I, not, not recommended in real life. Okay, so, so that's kind of how we got here. And, um, and so, you, so you can see, and in a minute, we'll kind of uh, let everybody walk through uh, and take a look at, you know, kind of like where everything is. But you can see, you know, Sudan grass, fava beans, tillage radish and then the fourth one over there is is obviously the control where there's no crop planted um, less obvious on the on the spots that have been mowed but uh, yeah so so as far as results um, we don't know yet we haven't gotten to the point uh, that we have been able to you know take our the readings at the end of the year all of our measurements at the end of the year um, and I guess I should say what we're going to measure is, uh, is uh, has anybody seen a, a, so a cone soil penetrometer? The whole, this is just, it's, it looks like a, like a, I don't know, like a pogo stick or something, but you push it into the ground and it tells you where the, where the compacted layer is and how much, uh, how, how strong the soil is, basically soil strength. Um, we're going to measure bulk density, because again, that's going to tell us about compaction. Um, soil, uh, uh, hydraulic conductivity, which we'll be able to see, you know, between the control plots with nothing planted ex except the weeds and the cover crop plots. Is there any difference between how well water moves through that soil? Um, and then we'll measure end of the season, nitrogen, um, weeds. We want to measure weeds, right? So we're going to measure biomass and, and weed coverage uh, so we can you know, we can discern which ones are better at suppressing weeds. And uh, I think that's most of it. Am I missing anything? That's the, the big stuff. Yeah. So that was exactly a question I was just almost asked. Um, and sorry if you, I missed this one a few or a little earlier. You just lay out one more time. I'll just repeat for me almost what you said, I guess. What are the goals for the cover crops? Because I had always come in assuming, yeah, I want to do cover crop for weed suppression of other things, but mostly to increase fertility, nitrogen, that kind of thing. So why not do fava and other things that, you know, uh, increase nitrogen, I guess, unless you don't want, you already have enough of it. So I was just wondering if you could just repeat again, almost what you said, the other, what's, what was your main purpose for these cover for, crops? For the ones we chose. Yeah, and, sure. uh, you know, like what exactly are you mostly measuring? Because it's hard to measure all those things at once with the control sort of thing so just like what are your main goals on these particular sure. ones if it's yeah. not for fertility because you already are adding so you must have almost eliminated that because you, you've already added uh fertilizer so is that not one of your goals in measuring this well so we are going to measure nitrate at the end of the season but yeah, the way that we kind of started is, you know, we mainly wanted to uh, see if we could, you know, add another tool to producers, farmers' toolbox as far as alleviating compaction. Okay. So we started that's out with... One. That's your number one goal on this is compaction, alleviating compaction? Yeah, and you know, uh, and we are measuring some of the other things like, you know, weeds and, uh, you know, biomass that's being added back into the soil because it's you know, you, you gain so much from a cover crop, right? Like the fava beans are doing nitrogen, Sudan grass is amazing at weed suppression. So, and there's actually, as far as like, why wouldn't you plant a lot of things? I mean, there are people using, you know, very elaborate cover crop mixes because maybe they do want to increase fertility and they want to add a lot of biomass and they want to suppress weeds. And, and you know, so they're kind of, 
uh, you know, some things are better than others. So they are, they are kind of, you know, these custom cover crop mixes. Um, and that's actually some folks, some folks think if you want to plant cover crops, just plant the thing that you really want, you know, plant the one thing, you know, if you really want nitrogen, don't mix your fava beans with radish because you want, you know what I mean? Just stick to the one thing. But anyway, does that, does that, does that answer your question? Did, uh, did you choose these, uh, like for instance, Amy, is compaction Amy's main problem or are you doing experiment generally? Um, well, so, okay. So that's actually, um, that's a good question. And I kind of touched on earlier the idea of, you know, kind of like the, the plow pan, right? Like, um, if you've been plowing, you know, every year right underneath where that heavy equipment goes is going to have that compressed layer. Um, but actually over at the, uh, the Puyallup, uh, at the research and extension center, we have this same thing going on, but a little bit, you know, there's another rep to it. Um, and it's different. That hasn't been plowed, uh, but there still is a compacted layer there. And that's just, you know, what did Todd say? 130 years of driving heavy equipment. Uh, and, and Doug doesn't like to plow, but it's been, you know, you do other tillage right above that layer. So the top, you know, 10 inches maybe isn't compacted anymore, but right under that it is. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's, it's caught yeah. up. No, thank you. I apologize. Okay, sure. Chris, to maybe kind of clear that up a little bit is that, um, He's not trying to solve our problem. We were just able to provide space for them to do their work, but we also have all the problems, so <laughs> <laughs> kind of gave them a good news. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it was it was great because, you know, it's just we wanted to do it a couple of different sites and we found just what we needed here. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and yeah, so I did. We did um, penetrometer readings. Basically, you know, there's dozens of plots. I can't remember how many off the top of my head, but there's dozens of individual beds. And I did six readings per bed. And in almost every single one, between nine and 13 inches, it stops. It is, you can't, like, if you, you could probably push it through, but you'd break it in half, you know? So it, it's, uh, it's many times, like, um, I think NRCS is standard for what, uh, it, what, when a soil reaches, you know, a compacted, you know, it's, officially compacted is i want to say 300 psi does that seem right oh it's so it's above 150 the, the yeah so yeah and this is an order of magnitude bigger than that pretty much it's it's very very at that layer it's compacted the top 10 inches is great but right under that you know 9 13 inches it is it is impenetrable to you know this penetrometer is that still topsoil or was that a clay layer because of the being the valley i don't think i don't think your soil is very clay there's actually what you're standing in is awfully sandy and then it gets a little bit more you know silty and loamy and then in the back corner it gets sandy again so i don't i don't i don't no, think it's just a... clay although one of the ideas uh around the causes of compaction is that when you're plowing and tilling uh that you know that top layer it's kind of breaking apart and you know it's like your your box of cereal right like the little the little stuff you know falls to the bottom and the bigger stuff is that is on the top right and so clay particles that are in the soil tend to tend to filter down into that that layer that uh that denser layer i just asked because our one acre is natural clay about 14 feet or inches down wherever we dug for another look. yeah and that was just yeah. naturally laid by whatever the last lahar river yeah was or yeah yeah clay's okay. clay clay makes it Thank a little you. tougher um but yeah so in anybody else any other thoughts or questions uh so uh there were a few a few things that we have observed you know i can't i can't tell you yet what the you know the penetrometer readings are going to tell us but um but one of the things that we definitely found is and you can see when you walk around is that uh the radishes do have pest damage uh the sudan grass and the and the fava beans do not uh more or less there's probably a little bit 
Uh, so that sort of reinforces the idea, right, that, that Amy probably doesn't want to grow radish as her cover crop. You guys are growing, you know, he's got radishes right over here. And, you know, there's, there's tons of, uh, uh, tons of, tons of uh, brassicas, right? So, um, oh, and so one of the other things that we have found that is going to be a little bit confounding for us is that, you know, you can kind of see it's a little bit downhill from over there a little bit downhill from over there, even a little bit downhill from here. So even the non-irrigated sections over here have a lot of water in the ground. So it's not, it's gonna be difficult to be able to say, you know, much between the irrigated and non-irrigated. But over at the Puyallup site, the non-irrigated stuff is, you know, it's dust, everything's a quarter the size, you know, it's very dramatic over there, the difference between the irrigated and the non-irrigated. That seems kind of intuitive, probably. Um, gosh, let me think here. Check my notes. What was your seed bed prep like? Oh, that was one of the, yeah, that's one of the notes, yeah. So um, we, over here, I think, let's see, he plowed it and then we, did we spade it after that? I think he plowed it and rototilled it. Yeah, okay. He plot wrote it. Yeah, we he did all spade the, this. Augustine and Amy did all the, Augustine probably did all the, <laughs> all the bed prep here, and then we just came and, and planted. With our no-till cedar. But for the August, um, we rototilled it again, because, you know, you get some weeds between. But that, yeah, and the, the other thing I was going to mention about that is, um, you know, we were going to do this August planting, but it hadn't rained, you know, in a month or two. And so one of uh, Doug's colleagues was like, well, you ought to pre-irrigate it because are you really going to advise a farmer to seed a bunch of stuff on in the first week of August? Probably not. So what we did is we, uh, we kind of pre-irrigated -pre all the non-irrigated spots so that there was some moisture. And then uh, when we went through with the, the seeder, we kind of went through, well, we do this We do this every time, but it was really important to check the depth of the seed uh, to make sure it's actually sitting in moisture. So we were, you know, brushed back painstakingly, brushed back the, the top layers to be able to see, yes, that Sudan grass seed is, is sitting in some moisture. We're, we're going to get some germination. Um, yeah, let's see. Just another comment on that. Uh and I don't remember here as much, but especially at Puyallup, we planted in July with no irrigation at all. You know, we'd had some really hot spells in June, and um, there was a, a dust mulch about two inches thick, and then really nice moisture below that. So we just planted all the seeds, and we did no pre-irrigation at that one, and we just made sure all the seeds were down into that dust mulch and got really good stands. It's not, that would not be ideal for the um, radish, but it still, it still came up, you know, that small seed being like two inches deep, but we got it into moisture. Yeah, and, and I, was, I was surprised at how well it germinated seeing this because I always learned, you know, small seed needs to go toward the top, but that, that Sudan grass seed was, you know, an inch tall after like four or five days or yeah. something like that. It's, out, it's outrageous. Um, so, uh, as far as, you know, what we do know at this point, the Sudan grass and the favas were amazing at suppressing weeds here. Uh, radish did pretty good, and actually the August plantings looked like they were maybe even a little bit more effective. Um, yeah, so, I think, I think that's more or less what we know, yeah. Um, is there any winter flooding or ponding that happens here, Amy? Not in this area. Not in this area. We literally um any other questions so far yeah how long is your trial how, just this year or several years we'll do yeah so it'll be this summer and next summer so this is kind of our, our first go we have you know three reps here four reps at uh, the puyallup site and then we'll do pretty much the same thing next year Uh, not for this trial. Yeah. No, yeah, we'll still, we'll still do some, some, uh, some tillage and bed prep for that. 
One other, so we, there was a, there was a whole concept of cover crop management, I guess, and we didn't really know exactly how we were going to manage all these cover crops, and we're still maybe flying a little bit by the seat of our pants. Yeah. But the Sudan grass, we had a really good idea, and one of the benefits of Sudan grass is you can plant it, and you're going to get really nice stand of Sudan grass, and then along with that, you're also going to get some weeds, and you can come in and mow the Sudan grass. So you kind of want to wait till those weeds start to flower, and then you can mow them and you really are going to knock back the weeds. The Sudan grass is going to come right back. So we knew what we were going to do with Sudan grass. Um, with the radish and the fava, we weren't quite so sure. So we still had the weed issue. Um, and what we ended up doing with the first planting was kind of waiting until they started to flower. So with the fava, that's going to be right when you're starting to get kind of maximum nitrogen. So that's when we decided to mow. So what triggered this mowing um, is more about weed control. I would say, yeah. and you know, rather than coming in and hand weeding, uh, we we mowed it, and um, we're still we don't know necessarily what the next step is. Um, yeah, yeah. The flowering, obviously, with the um, radishes, especially in Western Washington in general, if you were going to use that as a cover crop, flowering would be a big deal. Uh, there's a lot of brassica seed production in the northwest part, so. That's something we're interested in um, with the tillage radish, perhaps with that second planting, uh, which was August 6th. That may be late enough where we don't actually see flowers. Um, and so we can just leave that, you know, into the winter and allow those radishes to get kind of full size and then um, do what they're do gonna do. They're probably not gonna winter kill in this climate. So in a lot of climates where they use tillage radish, that's kind of how you get a lot of the benefits from it is it grows up really big and then it kind of rots out in the winter. So here that that probably won't happen. So um, not exactly sure how we'll manage yeah, yeah. <laughs> that in the spring or in the fall. But yeah, and you know, we even right now we're kind of waiting to see is the you know, is the radish gonna pop back up or right, you know, is it the, you know are we gonna have to power harrow it? Doug has a new implement that he's excited to to maybe use. So yeah, so a lot of that's still still up in the air. Oh, and uh, Robin's wondering if we if we've uh, seen any kind of like stale bed effect and um, with you know what in between plantings you're saying? Yeah, between the July planting and the August planting, do you see any less weed pressure in the later planting? Uh, that's that's a good question. TBD, I think. Um, did we did we weed? We must have weeded right before we planted not. Well, that's what right? he's talking about. We cultivated, yeah. Yeah. So here we used a rotor. I think at both places we used a rototiller. Or we but, might have spaded at Puyallup. Yeah. And, and, and at Puyallup, we, we spaded, waited Shallow for the weeds, and then basket weeded. weeded it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, we should here. I think uh, you would expect to see that, especially in the non-irrigated. Um, and so when we did do the pre-irrigation, we tried to do that couple of days before so mm -hmm. that's a tough thing because I, to get the stale seed bed you're talking about you'd want to pre-irrigate like a week or two two weeks probably before yeah. let some seeds come up and then and then cultivate one more but then you're gonna have lost all your moisture <laughs> yeah so we did the irrigation pretty close and then we cultivated and then we planted so um, may not have been as good for the weed control if you could have done that a couple of times um yeah right um yeah any other or were you were you no nope, you're, you're good i had something else but it wasn't must not have been that important yeah um uh, have you tried anybody tried planting um whatever crop after the sudan grass because of course the first thing i hear is like oh my god you're planting grass <laughs> um how do you how's the what, you know, when you're planting the next, when you do your next crop, mm -hmm. after having Sudan grass or any of these, uh, how, how do you keep it at bay? Well, the Sudan grass will winter It'll kill. It'll winter kill, yeah. Yeah, oh, okay. definitely. Yeah, and... Um, Even here, huh? Yep. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a pretty yeah. warm season, pretty warm <laughs> season plant. You can see this is the, this is just the alley area over here, and we planted all this to Sudan grass on July, on the same day, July 9th. It's and been mowed like, once. Really nice no irrigation no fertilizer um, these are fertilized here but this was not fertilized so if you've got a field that you know you're not gonna you know get to that's just you know yeah early july planting of sudan grass and look at the weeds look at how many weeds are over there you know like 
not very many comparatively. So yeah, that's Sudan grass. D Doug, it's no joke. It's <laughs> it's effective. Um, compared to what we have over here. In our <laughs> 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 yeah, that's that's a good uh, good comparison. Yeah. Uh, curious why you didn't use, or I, why you chose to use the the Sudan grass instead of like the sorghum Sudan hybrid or. What, I guess, what was behind the, the Sudan grass? Well, Doug's had a lot of experience with both, so he's probably better to answer Yeah, I've that. only planted the sorghum Sudan one time, and um, I wasn't uh, overly impressed with the difference. We also planted just Piper Sudan grass at the same time, and it did fine. It, it's cheaper and more easily available is kind of what I've observed. The Piper is the variety. Um, yeah, and I, I heard somebody else say recently, I can't remember the specifics, but I think, oh, well, I think it was down at the, the field day um, a few weeks ago, uh, he said that he really likes the uh, the hybrid sorghum Sudan because it's like the the, cow, the animals like it more or something like mm, that, but right. it's more tender or something like that. Um, 